Our friends at Perla are big proponents of simple, long-term investing, and now they're rewarding you for being a long-term investor too. Perla investors receive points every time they fund their account and invest. The more points you earn, the higher your chances to win one of their weekly prizes or the big prize at the end of the month. To get started, check out the competition terms and conditions and open your Perla account today using the links in your podcast player. This episode of the Australian Finance Podcast is proudly supported by GlobalX ETFs and the launch of the US100 ETF, better known as N100. N100 offers Australian investors exposure to 100 of the largest non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. N100 focuses on innovation-driven companies, providing a growth tilt to core portfolio holdings. You can learn more about N100, including reading the PDS and TMD by clicking the link in your podcast player or by simply heading to globalxetfs.com.au. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Jacob Fedek, welcome back to the Australian Finance Podcast, mate. It's great to have you with me. No, cheers, Owen. The last one was fun and um, yeah, pumped to be a part of this one as well. Yeah, great. Today, we're talking about 10 ways you know you can make a tax saving or you can understand the rules better here in Australia for when you're doing your, your tax return. Just some, I guess, tips and tricks from a professional accountant. Um, for those who don't know, Jake's from uh, AirTax, uh, a specialist in uh, all things tax. You can learn more about your own tax situation. You can you know do your own tax returns, your BAS statements, all that sort of stuff. Uh, with AirTax. Uh, you'll find all the links in the show notes. Uh, we've got some fantastic resources that we'll also include there for things like logbooks and anything that Jake mentions throughout this episode. So, mate, I'm basically going to be your student uh, for this episode. I've, I've asked you to prepare 10 things, some things for small business, many things for individuals as well. And, um, you know, we have some investors who listen to this show quite regularly. So, uh, mate, I'm going to hand it over to you and just ask follow-up questions. Maybe I'll ask, I'll be the the, the, I guess the eyes and ears of the person that needs to ask those silly little questions and just confirm things along the way. So, um, mate, over to you. Enough of me talking. Um, let's go through these 10 things that uh, our listeners should be aware of. Cool. Thanks, Owen. So, I wanted to start with some easy ones. Um, so, it's mm-hmm. a little ri- bit of a rinse and repeat of potentially what you may already know, but I think it's important just to cover them off um, and then we can go as, as complex as you want. Uh, if you're my student, you can cool. you can fire away questions. But um, yeah. a couple of quick ones that we spoke about earlier is definitely keeping your records up to date is just so important. So if you when you when we're talking about what is deductible and what isn't, if you don't even know what you've paid, you're going to really battle to actually come to come to terms with that. Um, so having your okay. records, waiting for your statements to be ready, like we said um, in the in the previous podcast, is so so important because it really does confuse things. Um, when you are kind of coming to your end, looking to actually complete your tax return, um, it's the easiest way to kind of get lost is to not have kind of track of your records and, and you're kind of just siphoning through what you think your capital gains might be, whether that's on an Excel spreadsheet that you, you're kind of tracking whenever you've got time, but it's not necessarily full coverage. All that sort of stuff can make it more confusing than it needs to be. So have oversight of your of your statements. Um, to drill down or... or ask a question. Go for it. a quick question. So I've raised my yep. hand for those people that are watching. Um, <laughs> so um, you said Excel. Um, two questions around that. Do you have any like templates or uh, are there like apps as well that can do this? Like um, I'm just thinking about how, how can this be made easier? Definitely. So there are, I mean, there's heaps of templates online, not necessarily for free via AirTax, but we've got like say a logbook template that definitely is. Um, free that's okay. an excel we'll that helps you calculate your your um like business travel uh, portions uh i would say there's heaps of free apps that you can download um similar to like even like your split wise and all that sort of stuff um that helps track general expenses you can actually set up like a, a business version of that as well um even with yourself hmm. if you wanted to to help track it we spoke about um 
even like having a corporate, say, credit card that you're using to help track those expenses too. So it may not necessarily need to be in Excel if it's just simple additions that you wanted to keep track of, even if there's a lot of expenses. Um, mm-hmm. But I would, yeah, I would have a look online. I'd have a look on um, on a favorite one of mine, even looking at your tax rate, which I have to mention is is uh, paycalculator.com mm. as, as well, which I just think is cool for people to work out. Um, paycalculator.com. Yeah, yeah, I think there's an AU on the, on the back of there. No link to AirTax as well, but um, it's just helpful when you're looking at your net pay and trying to work out if you get a pay rise, say, from June 30, um, what that should be next. I know that's a little bit off the off the track of investments, but it's so relevant for employees, even a bonus, sure what that looks like in terms of take home. So I think that one's cool. Um, but yeah, there's a heap out there. I think, I mean, even going back to your traditional account to say, hey, I'm, I'm thinking of investing in X. Um, can you give me like a brief overview or can we have like a, a 10 minute chat, which we, I mean, we could definitely do on AirTax as well um, for free to help walk through that investment. We can't give you direct financial advice to say yes or no, go ahead with it, but we can say yeah. what it looks like from a tax perspective. Um, and that helps you make, I suppose, more in, informed decisions as well, which is pretty relevant. So yeah, I, I think, I mean, it doesn't give you a direct answer, but there's a lot out there. Um, pick one, don't have a lot going because you just won't do any of them. Uh, is my other rule <laughs> so pick one that you like and that's easy to use um and go for your life yep i like it mate that's great keep those records wait for the statements like keep track of them i like it mm-hmm. um the other easy one is the 80 cent per hour for employees i think that's still my biggest that's my favorite um what that is is you're effectively working out how much uh time you spent working from home so at an hourly rate you're then, you can calculate per week. Um, you can then uh, basically either average that over the year or, or total your hours up to work out how much you've you've done for the year in terms of working actually physically from home and then use that 80 cents per hour to determine how much you can claim as a working from home deduction. Really easy. So if I work, so if I work from home all time, all time, so full time, like 37 and a half hours, 80 cents, would I then claim it by 48 weeks of the year or 52? Sorry, I know I'm getting into numbers. Numbers aren't good on podcasts, but is that what I would do? Exactly. Yep. That's what you do. Yeah, so, so that's so like you... 1400 bucks. So that's pretty good if I work from home full time. Completely. And that's no real cash out of your pocket that, you, that you're um, able to claim that deduction for. So I think that one's an awesome one. Um, so they're, they're kind of the high level, we'd call them the easy pieces to kind of, um, they're not, I mean, they, they can still lead to a pretty good, pretty substantial tax deduction and less headaches in terms of keeping records and everything else. So I, I don't want to um, kind of make them less important. They are really important, but they're high level, what would kind of suggest in the first instance. If you're then more tax keen, I wanted to have a few that are more kind of deeper dive, more sophisticated around, pot- potentially relevant to say um, your higher income earners that are joining as well. Um, not, mm-hmm. I mean, say Can if I- it's, yep, go for it on. I've just got one question, just raising my hand again. So have we done two or three? So far I've got records and like keeping records and then I've got home office expenses. Was the seeking advice on investments a second tip or was that, I'm, uh, I'm keeping track here. Let's call it Let's call it a second tip. Yep. Okay, um, cool. Okay, I got it. Let's get on with these advanced ones. Sorry, man. <laughs> All good. Uh, so concessional super contributions um, is and superannuation, I shouldn't use short terms. Um, Concessional superannuation contributions is a really um, fun slash can be pretty kind of neat in terms of reducing your tax overall. Um, So superannuation is obviously you're having that paid automatically by your employer somewhere between Mm -hmm. like 10 and um, it depends on you might be say working for a university or um, sometimes in healthcare you have higher rates of concessional contributions contributed on your behalf, which is awesome. Um, but it's a really quick way to build cash, definitely. Sadly, you don't get to see it for a, a long time, depending on your age, but um, it's mm. something that it's operating in the background. Where you can kind of bring it to the forefront in, in how it impacts you today um, is fun to talk about now. So um, if you're open to that, we can we can look a bit further. Yeah, yeah, into, let's talk about it. Can, can, mm-hmm. you just, can you just, before we do that, can you just explain what concessional tax contributions are? Definitely. So concessional tax contributions are made from pre-tax income. So you can use, say, usually it's your employer um, out of your gross pay paying those directly to your superannuation fund that you've picked. 
And so, so you that's see- that's like that 9.5 or 10% or whatever it was. Exactly, exactly. Yep. yep. It's, um, it's legislated that they have to do that. So it's, um, it's, mm-hmm. it's a really cool one. <laughs> you don't need to kind of raise your hand and say, can you please contribute? <laughs> they need to do yep. that for you. Um, so they should be contributing superannuation. Um, you can check it on your payslip as well. I still check mine to make sure like, what looks like the right amount's gone in. Um, and mm-hmm. it's probably another one back to those statements is know your login details for your super. It's crazy. Like if I talk to my even my brother <laughs> or anyone else in the mum and dad, whoever it might be, a lot of them just don't know their password, never been in, couldn't care <laughs> less, <laughs> which is something, I mean, I kind of get it. It's, it's off-roading in the background. You don't necessarily, um, there's not like a tangible impact to you at, uh, at the moment, but I would definitely be, be interested in at least having a look at your balance, um, not necessarily constantly tinkering with your investment profile or anything else, um, but just, yeah, have oversight of it. Be keen enough to, mm. to know what's going in, to track your balance, to know your contributions, all that sort of stuff. Um, it just gives you better insight into what's going on. So, um, sure. yeah, that's superannuation contributions. The concessional cap, so there are caps to super, which makes it confusing pretty quickly. Um, the concessional mm. cap is actually going up. So it's... It's twenty seven and a half thousand dollars um, going forward, and what that means is your employer can actually contribute up to that cap on your behalf um, at fifteen percent tax, which is pretty cool. So you can imagine um, that's a lot less usually than salary that you're paying, particularly if you're a high income earner. You might be paying thirty seven, forty five, forty seven if you're subject to the highest and Medicare levy. So to pay tax within the fund only at fifteen percent of those contributions are going in you're at a massive tax advantage. So this might be someone that's earning like, when you say high income earning, you're talking about someone that might be even earning 80 or 90,000, 100,000, not necessarily like 200,000, just to be clear, right? Like that, that works too, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we'll talk about in a second why super is potentially, I suppose, less tax effective um, the more you earn as well, which is okay. a unique problem. Um, so yeah, definitely around those brackets. Uh, you're you're getting a tax uh, a tax advantage for sure. Fifteen percent is okay. lower than the lowest tax bracket, for instance. So you're always an advantage, yep. um, regardless of what you're earning. Okay. So what you can do is elect to actually for your employer to contribute more on your behalf. Um, and mm-hmm. once again, I'm towing the line between financial advice and tax advice, but I just want to break it down around like how you practically do that and then what it means for you from a tax perspective. So mm-hmm. you've got, let's call it 10% going into the fund, a bit over. Um, if you're on, if we actually put numbers to it um, and we'll try and keep it simple, but say you're on $100,000, you got roughly 10 grand per year going into the fund. Um, like we said, that's taxable at 15%, not at your marginal tax rate, which is a good thing. You're building an investment then um, with essentially pre-tax dollars, um, which is awesome. So that's the first bit. You may already know that. Good work if you do. Um, you may already be tracking that. Even better work if you do. If you don't, you should. Uh, you've got then from that ten thousand dollars that's going in, you've got seventeen and a half thousand in terms of room to move before you hit the concessional cap. Really importantly, so what you can do is elect f- through your employer to actually contribute more if you want to, um, and that's sometimes although it's in terms of cash flow, you're not going to see that cash. Um, for a long time, particularly if you're, say, like in your 20s or 30s, it is the best investment vehicle when you look at like leverage in terms of less tax pay going in and compounding in terms of before you then are taking that cash out, um, you're maximizing one, the like financial efficiency, but also tax efficiency going into the fund. So if you want to contribute more up into the cap, you can. Um, what I wanted to talk about as well is you can either do that via your employer. So noting that you want to make additional contributions, you can usually do that on stuff like Workday and things, depending on what your employer uses. Um, mm-hmm. But you can also make after tax, so post tax contributions and turn those into concessional contributions, which is pretty fun. Um, okay. So what that means is you can claim a tax deduction at the end of the year um, up to the concessional cap. So to simplify it again, let's call it 100K worth of salary, 10 and a bit in the fund, you want to make an additional 10K um, contribution. So you've paid, when, you're, when you're receiving that 10K, you've already paid your, um, your marginal tax rate on that income because that's after tax dollars. So effectively, mm-hmm. it's, you've, you've lost a bit in between. But what you can do is 
before 30 June of that year, really importantly, you can say to your super fund and it's called a notice of intent to claim. Um, and you can just jump online, Google that. Um, we could even put it in the show notes as well if you want. Uh, it's a standard form that you complete to say, hey, I want to claim these contributions in my tax return. And basically, as we said, turn them into concessional contributions. And what that allows you to do is one, build your super balance really quickly and two, claim a big to tax tax at the end of the year to get your marginal tax rate that you've paid back on those contributions, really importantly. So okay. I'll stop there. Student Owen, do you okay, have okay. questions on those? Yep. <laughs> yes, I do. So you said before, like it, the salary sacrifice, I guess, is what we no- normally know that kind of setting it up with your employer. You said that it pays 15% tax going into the super. So if that $10,000 goes into the super, do I have to pay that or does that happen automatically at that 15%? So it happens automatically. The fund pays okay. that on your behalf, importantly. So it's never like a cash outage that you need to fork out yourself. It's reducing your balance within the fund as that tax paid. It's another thing if you open up your super account, you'll see that um, as like a, a negative against your balance. Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. And um, so just to confirm, if I just take my normal salary and I put it into my bank account, then it becomes after tax because my with my employers withheld the tax on the way through. But then you're saying if I have say five grand, if I have 10 grand and I think I want to put this into my super fund, I can then like be pay or direct deposit that into my super fund. And provided that I lodge this notice of intent to claim form, like say I'm with Australian super, if I send make however I do that, um, then I could potentially claim that five or ten thousand dollars as a tax deduction, correct? Exactly, exactly. Which is really cool. When do I have to send the notice of intent to claim? Like, do I have to send that before June thirty as well, or do I? How does that work? Yeah, so you you have to have the notice of intent to claim. So you should do it well before June thirty, and you have to have made the contribution itself before June thirty. Okay, cool. That's yep. good to know. Yeah. So um, this is something. So now, if I just take off my student hat for a second, this is something that I told to my mum's partner. He runs his own business, and he's never in his life contributed to super. And I said, "Well, mate, you're looking at retiring in the next five or ten years. Why don't you just put some of your cash that you got sitting in your bank account into super and let it grow for you? Claim a tax deduction on the way in." And he's like, "What? I can do that?" I'm like, "Yes, there's a limit, but you can do that. Just set up a superannuation account and." put it in um so i think this is like yeah for a lot of people that are prepared to put their money in super i think that's the big decision do you want to put your money into to super um yeah like you said you're speaking from the tax side of things i'm speaking from the investing side of things mm-hmm. um makes a lot of sense cool that's a good one so that's number four all right i'm, I'm keen for number five mate yep um so <laughs> one extension on that as well that i think uh compounds how good it is is you can actually use caps that you didn't in previous years to, so we talked about 27,500. Um, if you're well under the threshold in, in prior years as well, you can use those extra little um, little bits of fat left uh, in your contributions in prior years to actually top up in the current year. So confusingly enough, what I mean by that is, say you had um, for the last two years, you had that $10,000 going in. Um, you've got roughly, I mean, it was 20, uh, 27 and a half this year, but 25 for previous years, you've got 15K, 15K, and then 17 and a half. You could make a big lump sum contribution and still be under the cap, interestingly enough. So there's a, there's a couple of quirks around what your super balance is. So it has to be like, I think current cap's about 500K that you need to be under to make that contribution. Um, but it's, it's a really big one that if you do have cash at hand and you want to boost, boost your super balance, to your example, um, it can be even kind of, yeah, even more beneficial when you're looking at uh, maximizing that that actual deposit um, by using prior year caps. You might not know this off the top of your head, but how far back could I go? So I think the rules were brought in 2019. Um, so it's from then onwards. So and it's usually about okay. five years in um, that you can look back. So starting from 2019, um, moving forward, uh, yeah, contingent on balance and, and uh, other things, it's definitely worthwhile having a look into. Okay, we'll put some links in the show notes to more information on that because that sounds like I'm thinking, to be honest, I'm thinking of someone that's like doesn't want to invest in their own name, acknowledges that super is a really good way for them to do it. They're thinking of retiring in the next 10 or 15 years, maybe in 20 years, whatever their circumstance may be. Um, they're thinking, well, I could do this. You know, I could put extra in and I could do it regularly. Um, I feel like, yeah, money for jam. Okay, cool. I like it. 
Completely. Um, the other one is, yes, yeah, someone that's been living overseas that hasn't had super. Oh, um, yeah, of course. Like my brother and his wife live in London. Um, it's it's awesome if they come back and they've got unused caps. Um, they can actually, mm. yeah, contribute to that, which is which is really cool. Um, the other one is then related to, it's, it's tax, it's also finance, um, but it's an additional one for superannuation that I want to talk about for really high income earners that um, may be relevant, mm-hmm. may not be. I'll, I'll move through it quickly only because it's probably only a certain segment of the audience as well. But where you're mm-hmm. earning over 250K um, for the year, this becomes less tax effective. And the reason being is because there's Division 293 tax that comes into play. Super loves being fun in terms of technical terms. But what that does is it boosts even for concessional contributions. Instead of the 15% into the fund, it makes you actually top that up to 30%, which is a pretty hefty okay. increase and makes it far less effective um, when you're putting those concessional contributions in. So it is, as I said, you have to be a, a really high income earner to be hit with that tax. Um, but if you're earning over 250K, it's probably worth getting some proper like accounting finance advice before you do something like that because sometimes something sounds tax tax effective to start with and there's, there's a kind of supplementary rules, I suppose, in the background that you can get stung with at the end of it. Quick question for this. Um, if I Let's say if I'm a high income earner and my money goes into the super fund, and it goes above the twenty-seven and a half thousand. So is that thirty percent on the twenty-seven and a half, or is it anything above that? So it's on the on the twenty-seven and a half, and then there's a separate okay. tax for concession or for contributions that are above the concessional limit. Hmm. I feel mm-hmm. like I remember something around like being able to withdraw um, amounts above the twenty-seven and a half thousand. You can, you can. So you can do both. You can pay your Division 293 from your super fund. So it doesn't need to be, mm-hmm. you can pay it directly and you can actually take out when you've contributed more than you probably should have or wanted to initially. Um, you can actually take that out in cash from your super fund too. So definitely, yeah. that, that still exists. Got and it. you can do that either via your tax agent or you can do it in your uh, MyGov account pretty easily. Okay, cool. Good to know. So for those mm-hmm. of you that are earning more than 250K, um, there's some strategies there. Cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I think those are great, mate. Lots of super there. And home office applies to a lot of people. Definitely. So the next one I wanted to look at is small business because I think that's that's relevant to your audience. It's relevant to um, people that have got, whether it's like side hustles or it might be their, their sole income. Um, so I mean, rules in terms of uh, how asset write-offs are complex. So I'll, I'll, I'll start off with just like it, it, you should really, this is one where if you get the right advice, you can really help yourself in terms of reducing that tax bill that you've got. For to sure, with. for sure. Um, so yeah, it's the thing that kind of you're standing around the barbecue if you are uh, talking tax. <laughs> Maybe it's only the barbecues that I go to <laughs> and no one else wants to talk tax, but they've got this guy that's standing there talking tax. Who knows? Uh, but it's something that would come off around, okay, you've bought a bunch of stuff. How do you treat it for tax purposes? And if you are a small mm. business and <laughs> pretty crazily enough, a small business uh, is in the ATO's eyes, there's massive thresholds that are relevant to these rules. So we're talking like billions of dollars rather than, Tens of thousands. Um, so right. basically, everyone listening, unless we've got Elon Musk, hopefully he's listening. Hey, Elon. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're all small businesses um, for, these, for okay. the purposes of these rules. Um, so you can, they've been extended and there's a couple of different terms. So if you're doing some research or you're talking to an accountant, it's, it's sometimes referred to as asset write-offs or even temporary full expensing as well, which is another interesting kind of term that means the same thing. And what it means is if you're purchasing, like, say, a new asset and you're using that within the business, um, so it has to be in the same year that you're actually, say, installing it and actually practically using it within your business, you can actually claim that as a, as a full write-off, so the full cost of that asset like, as a deduction in your, um, against any income that you're earning for that year, which is an awesome kind of... Give me of, an example. Definitely. So say you're using a, a car, for instance, as part of your business... Um, and you've purchased that this year. You're driving around. It might be that you're a painter and you're doing. You've, got a, you've, you've bought a van. Um, you can actually claim the, the the purchase cost of the van as a asset write off. So it goes across. Uh, it goes against any income tax that you're paying at the end of the year. Um, there are a couple of quirky rules. Uh, there's heaps of different 
like it's it's so versatile as a rule so i don't want to put people off but i just want to note that like if we're talking cars you can't go out and purchase like a ferrari um and claim that as a deduction um there's thresholds and things usually it's about 65k for cars <laughs> yeah i know it's all those people driving around ferraris um so like be aware of what they are kind of work within the rules if it's like buildings and things um that are you're getting capital works deductions for so once again you can't go out as a business buy a a big block of land or something or a, or a building or a an apartment you're working out of and claim the full amount of that against your, your, your taxes, which I've seen before. Um, so that's important too. And then sometimes like there's other assets that have separate schemes, whether it be like fencing or, or, or random farming pieces um, that have specific rules already that goes against them. But for, we're talking like 90, 95% of assets, it's awesome. You can, you can buy it, you can, um, claim it for that year that you're actually using it within your business so i think that's a massive one that you're like we're not talking about a couple of hundred bucks we're talking about thousands of dollars um, that you're reducing your tax bill by um, and it's good that it's been extended it's almost like a stimulus that's been put forward by the government for small businesses given that how hard it's been over the last couple of years can i ask two questions around this then um one like let's say i've got a home office that i haven't had before and i'm trying to set it up so i like I spend a bit of money, like I spend say two or three thousand dollars. I get a desk uh, installed. I get uh, some cabinets or whatever. Um, would that fall under this, or is that not what this is? It would. It would. The only thing that's really important is that it's for small businesses. So for everyone else that's joining as employees, um, that yep. yeah aren't running a business, that's it's not relevant. You you can default back to the eighty cents, um, or you can. Okay still depreciate those assets. It's usually easy just to use the 80 cents, to be honest, unless you're doing like a full-scale setup. Um, but if you're a small business, then a lot of that stuff that you mentioned is, is definitely relevant. Yeah, so like if I was like a contractor where I have my own ABN and I'm like, I don't know, maybe I'm like doing a lot of stuff through like a few different businesses where I do like design work or I do freelance this, freelance that. So that's what I'm thinking. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The, other thing, the other thing is I've got a mate um, who has a gardening and lawn business. So he does like lawns of all different types. Like he works for schools. He does like domestic stuff. He has like ride on lawn mowers. He has a couple of cars, trailers, that sort of stuff. Is this like all, all of these things would be an example of things that he might be able to think about using with under this rule? Completely. Yep. All awesome examples. Yep. Okay, great. That's cool. I like it. So um, just quickly on that though, um, I would just say maybe uh, if I take my student hat off for a second and just took chuck on my business hat, you still need to spend money to make the deduction. So don't go and cripple your business just because you can get a tax deduction. If you think, oh, I could get a car for $30,000 and you can't afford the car. <laughs> so <laughs> Completely. Just, yeah, be, be realistic. Like it sounds great to have a tax deduction, but if a $30,000 is all of the cash that you have in the bank for your business, maybe, just maybe it might not be right for you right now. So um, cool. Good one, mate. That's I really like that one for small business. Um, and it's an awesome intro into the next one that I want to talk about, which is negatively geared properties. <laughs> so I think this one <laughs> okay, I get questions perfect. all the time on. Um, and I think talking about, okay, what's the actual cash advantage versus the tax perspective on it is is so crucial to, to understanding. I mean, for anyone that's learned about small businesses, the number one reason they go under is cash flow. They just, they, they do stuff they couldn't afford to, to do to start with. Um, and so investment properties are kind of similar in that sense. I think they're so popular in Australia. And I think this, I wanted to chat about this one with interest rates going up as well, because it will become more relevant mm-hmm. if it's not already. Um, it can, it can tweak properties that were potentially positively geared beforehand into negatively geared properties, unfortunately. Um, and so, to, to, to start at a top level, basically, if you do have a property that you are using as an investment, um, it's almost like you're running your own little business. So you've got your rental income that's coming in. Um, in terms of cash flow, you've then got separate expenses, like it could be management fees. Um, it could be water and, and other utilities that you're paying. Uh, anything that you're paying that your tenant's not uh, is, is relevant for an investment property. Uh, there's also like potentially depending on quirky rules around how old the property is and what assets are in it, you can claim depreciation of some of the stuff within it as well. So once you get to the end of the tax year, you're reconciling all those pieces of income against the expenses that you've got and you're coming to a, a net position overall. Um, and so that net position is either good, you're making money from it, or bad, you're losing money from it. 
where people get probably overly excited, Owen, to your point, is they think, okay, um, I can have three negatively geared properties and I get an awesome tax deduction at the end of the year because yeah. you might be losing 10 grand on each of them. All of a sudden, you've got a 30K deduction that you can claim, um, which is, yes, awesome, but too really hard to finance, particularly if you're not earning that much money. Um, so mm. I think separating the, the finance piece to the tax piece, as interest rates go up and you're paying, you can't claim a tax deduction for the capital component of what you're paying, importantly. Sometimes people just go, all right, how much did I pay to the bank? Bang, here's all my my payments. I'm claiming that much as as my deduction for the property that I'm earning. That's 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 wrong. Um, you need to really separate out, separate out how much was the interest versus if it's principal mm. and interest, the principal component, and only claim the interest. But as interest rates go up, I think we're going to see more properties become negatively geared, and therefore don't lose sight of actually claiming that in your return and properly tracking your expenses because particularly for, for high income earners that have a couple of properties, you're still getting a really substantial tax deduction. And they're probably the individuals that it's more relevant for um, that can actually hold um, and continue to finance those properties. I'm just claiming, just writing down, you can only claim the interest component of the repayment, um, which is really important for a lot of folks. Um, I feel like, I don't know, just my gut feel, like I feel like a lot of these properties, people might, if interest rates do slow the growth of investment properties, uh, the prices of properties, there, a lot of these might, um, you know, come to market and they might, you know, be sold off. And uh, which case, if you do sell an investment property for a capital gain, I'm guessing that goes into your tax return. And if you hold it for more than 12 months, that, that you, you pay only capital gains tax on half of that. Is that right? Completely. So you're stealing one of my tips, but yes. So Oh, damn it. Okay, let's, let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next so, one. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about, and this is definitely relevant for properties, but also relevant for shares as well. Um, and so for people that are doing any sort of capital investing where you're working out if you've got a gain or a loss, um, it's one of the harsher taxes. We talked about on the previous episode around progressive taxes um, and tax bans. And when you earn over a certain amount, you're only paying tax attributable to the amount over that band, really importantly. Capital gains is one that is really different to those rules, annoyingly. So you can hold an asset for 364 days and sell it and pay mm. full capital gains and not get the reduction. Or if you hold it for 370 days, you're only paying 50% of that gain. So it's a really unfortunate one that we see all the time in people just that could have potentially held out the extra month or whatever it might be. We see it more with shares rather than property. Um, but knowing when you purchase the asset and how long you need to hold it for to qualify for the 12 months is so important. I see this most commonly for people coming into, and this is quite technical, so um, yeah, stop me wherever you want, but say someone's coming into Australia and holds a whole bunch of shares and they're new to Australia, um, if they then go on and sell those shares and, and they're taxable on those, they could have been living offshore for a, a long time. Um, mm. They're picking up the value of the shares that they held when they flew in so that becomes their cost base if they've been a non-resident. Huh. So that's that's one interesting point. They then need to hold it for 12 months though um, before they sell that share to qualify for the 50% reduction. Um, and people kind of get excited. They see a good gain. They sell it. Um, and <laughs> sometimes there's people that work for the same company as well and they, they're talking and they're like, why is my tax bill so much higher than yours? And they work out that one guy sold it a little bit later than the other guy and one got the reduction and the other didn't. So it seems like a, a weird rule, but it is super, super relevant. And knowing when you bur like what the cost-based date is, is so important because there's a couple of tricky, tricky pieces in there. Um, the other one, we, you might have listeners if that are lucky enough to get shares that are, we call it vested, but basically shares that are given to them by their employer, which is a really neat way to kind of compensate people outside of salary. Mm. Um, so it's becoming more and more common, particularly with startups and um, tech oriented business, even with banks as well. Equity as an employee is, is definitely relevant. So the important piece for capital gains is you have a date that you get given that share, which we call your vest date. And you need to hold that share for a further 12 months before you sell it to qualify for the 50% gain, uh, reduction on the gain, I should say. Okay, I'm just going to ask you one question. Can you give us an example of what the the fifty percent deduction is, so because I think people are going to be some people may be a little bit confused around what am I getting this fifty percent de reduction on? What is this? Definitely. So the fifty percent deduction. Let's use a practical example. You bought shares for ten grand. You've held the shares for two years. 
the shares are now worth 20. So you've got a 10K gain there. And when you come to file your tax return, you're able, instead of paying the full 10 grand, you're able to reduce that 10 grand by 50%. So in effect, you've got five grand now that's sitting there that's then taxable at your marginal tax rate. So that that's the way that kind of the 50% reduction rule works. The other important piece to think about is if you've got losses that you want to offset against that, you can't reduce it and then claim the losses. You have to claim the losses and then reduce it. So what I mean by that, we'll go back to the example. Um, you've got a 10K worth of, oh, you, you've bought t- shares for 10K, sorry. You're selling them when they're worth 20. You've got 10K again. You know you got the 50% reduction, but you've also got 2K worth of losses from last year um, when you sold shares that you didn't make a gain on. And so what you need to do is reduce your 10K by the 2K first. So you've got an 8K gain and then use the 50% reduction to get to 4K. What we see people kind of do is the reverse of that. So the reverse of that is, you use the 50% reduction. So you got 5K sitting there after your 10K gain. Then you offset your losses. So you got 3K. Mm. Um, and so the rules are kind of pretty specific around when you use losses and how you have to actually allocate them really importantly. So Makes sense. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it can be kind of quite technical if you're someone that trades shares all the time. Um, there's other rules that are relevant to you as well, but you may have seen it before. So I would say, once again, as we've been chatting, get some proper advice because it kind of helps lead into, um, yeah, how you're taxed. Yeah, for sure. Capital gains is a very important part of all losses, is a very important part for all investors. So it's really important. There is actually a document, and I'm sure you have some of this on air tax as well. There is actually a document that's put out by the ATO, which is, I think it's called um, tax for share investors or tax for ETF investors. It's like this document, a PDF, um, where they have a few different scenarios in there as well. So um, I'll try and put a link in the show notes to that. Um, mate, that's number nine. So we've got, well, it's number nine by my count. It might be eight, but we've got one or two more to go. So um, keen for these last two. Yeah, my, so number, we'll call it number nine. Um, the last one that I wanted to talk to, and I'll combine them into two, um, could be nine and 10. So is okay. the Medicare levy is a really important one. This is some sometimes um, it hurts people at the end of the piece when they're filing their tax return. Mm. If you're earning over 90K, uh, you're already paying the Medicare levy, which is 2% on your uh, on your income. You can't get out of that if, you're, if you've got access to Medicare. The only people that can get out of that is, say, where you don't have reciprocal rights. Probably not overly relevant for today's discussion. That would be someone that's coming in from, say, the US, for instance, that's not a permanent mm. resident that can't access Medicare and then shouldn't pay the Medicare levy, so it doesn't have to. Uh, but for the vast majority of the listeners, you, you have to pay the Medicare levy. What you don't have to pay is a Medicare levy surcharge, uh, which mm. is an additional 1.5% or up to based on your income. Um, and so if you're earning over 90K or 180K as a family, you want to have relevant private health insurance. Um, otherwise, what happens is if you don't, and it needs like say private hospital as part of that as well, there's a few things you need to tick within your insurance. Um, so it's, it's important because if you don't have that, it's usually much cheaper to get the basic form of relevant private health insurance than pay the Medicare levy surcharge. The surcharge is based on like all benefits. So sometimes if you had fringe benefits and things sitting in there as two, it can also lift that balance too. Um, and you don't have tax withheld on, on, um, in relation to Medicare surcharge. So your employer just assumed you don't have to pay it because you had the right uh, uh, private health insurance. And so it's always one that unless you had really big deductions to offset it, that you're going to have to pay at the end of the year. So it's an ugly one in that sense. Whereas the Medicare levy, you do have taxes withheld against that income. So that's one long story short, talk to your healthcare provider if you've paid it in the past because you don't want to pay it this year. And it's one that it's subject to a daily count. So even if you've got it now, right now, you're still going to reduce what you would have paid um, come 30 June, which is important. Yeah. That's what I see a lot of people get sucked in by. Like, um, well, first of all, it's like the April one or April 1st increase of um, health insurance prices. But then there's like the other thing, which is often marketed on the back of that is, you know, you, you could save on tax and stuff like this, but you have to have cover for the full year, right? To avoid all of the Medicare levy surcharge. 
Is yep. that correct? Like you, you can't just correct. get it on June 29th and then hold it for two days and then think that you're going to get away with it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah. And it's it's a funny question that we get all the time. People are like, nah, I'll just wait. Yeah, exactly that. Wait to, wait to June, get it then. Then they have to pay one month premiums and I'm out. Yeah. No, you're going to have to pay the Medicare levy surcharge on 11 months and you'll just get away with that one month that you had it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So, uh, All the schemes. <laughs> <laughs> People think they're winning with their, yeah, they may not be winning as much as they thought, which is still nice. <laughs> um, and the last really quick one is income protection insurance. Um, seems, I think, seeing that, I, I always feel it's a big cost, particularly if you're high income earner. Sometimes it's up to like 10 grand um, that you're paying. Um, which is a massive premium um, in terms of an out-of-pocket piece that you're you're paying during the year. I think why I think this is relevant. It's always it always comes front of mind for me um, as a conservative accountant. Whenever interest rates are rising and people are like thinking, okay, shivers now, my, like all my expenses seem to be increasing. If you're the sole income earner and you don't have income protection insurance, it's even more scary. I would say um, I wouldn't necessarily be an advocate. I don't have inject- protection insurance myself. Maybe I don't earn enough, um, but I would say. If you are someone who's considering it, um, as part of their marketing spiel, they usually tell you this anyway, but I just want to make make sure everyone knows that you can claim that as a deduction in your return. So it makes it far less scary. Say it's like, oh, how could I possibly stomach the 500 or, or a grand a month it might be? It's just undoable. When you think, okay, if you're a high-income earner, you might be paying 47%. You're actually paying almost half of that really and getting the rest back at at tax so something to consider um it's not necessarily i'm not necessarily a, an advocate either way but um it's definitely something you don't want to miss the deduction given the size of some of the premiums that i that i do see for it particularly for like executives as well yeah um yeah the income protection insurance it's it's one of those things where people are like oh well i've got work cover so i don't need it but i always think because i play footy on weekends mate i see <laughs> some of my friends get injured or even i'm i'm okay because i work behind a desk even if i broke my leg i could probably still work whereas a lot of people that are manual labor or whatever if they hurt themselves um and they don't have some sort of income protection uh they're, and they're, if they're the sole breadwinner for their family or whatever they can be stuffed so i always say to them well look at getting income protection um it's boring i know you got to pay it i know but one thing is because it's linked to your income, you could um, potentially have it as a tax deduction. Uh, you can also get it inside super, but then it's a different ball game from a tax perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, now, just to confirm this uh, with you, let's say worst case scenario, I injure myself and I need to claim on my income protection insurance. If I get, say, I don't know, just pull and figure out $5,000 a month from my income protection insurance. If I was on that this year, do I have to put that in my tax return? It usually is still taxable if it's basically like a like for like salary component. Sometimes you get like permanent disability and things that are paid, um, particularly like TAC payments and things like that that aren't always uh, taxable. But if it's something from an insurance provider that kind of supplements salary, then it usually is. And they they should tell you um, based on the policy that you're getting um, when it pays out if or if, if it isn't taxable. But usually if it's under income protection insurance, it's basically like a salary that you're receiving. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, just one final, final question for me. Uh, do you know roughly what the average tax return is most years? Uh, so in terms of a refund or... Yeah, um, just for like all of Australians, if they do one, roughly what they get back? Yeah, so it's usually between... I think it's there is ATO data on it as well. Um, about two grand, I, I want to say. Mm, that's what I have in my mind too. Yeah, um, and it does vary year on year. Yeah, because that's a lot of money for people. Definitely. And, and a little plug for AirTax, um, you can, so when you get to the end of the process, it will tell you if your expenses look high compared to other or low compared to other income earners in that bracket <laughs> and that occupation. So you can kind of get a sneak peek into whether or not you're likely to get one of those like scary looking letters from the ATO um, before you actually click submit. So I, I like stuff like that. Vinegov actually does yeah. the same thing too. So it will say like, it won't give you in the reverse, of course. They're not going to say your deductions look too low, <laughs> which which your tax will do. Uh, but they will say they look too high. Do you want to reconsider? So um, I think that's relevant <laughs> just when you're talking refunds and talking what people like in similar brackets or ages or whatever it might be. Um, little kind of tricks like that help. For sure. Yeah, for sure. We've, um, I'm going to be joined by Kate on the next tax episode. We're going to talk about how we can spend our tax returns and invest mm-hmm. it and whatever. Um, but just to recap some of the stuff you mentioned here, Jake, we've got keep the records 
you know, I think that's so important. Um, you know, there's, we've got the log book from AirTag, so we'll put that in the show notes, but, you know, just look around the internet or make your own. And there are some apps as well. Um, get tax advice on big investments before you make them. So, um, you know, whether it's an investment property, a business, whatever, um, speak to your accountant, understand the tax implications, or even if it's like a big super payment, you want to get confirmation on that. Home office expenses is for employees, uh, 80 cents per hour can add up. I did the calculations on the fly before if I worked at home full time, it's about $1,400 of expenses that I could claim. Um, that's not, that doesn't mean you get $1,400 back. It just, that's the, the, the claim. Um, so concessional tax contributions, the limit is now $27,500 a year. You can do a salary sacrifice or you can claim a, a tax deduction through a notice of intent claim form. Um, you can use the caps from prior years. I forgot about that, mate. So that was a really good one, really big one. Um, we've got super for people that earn 250K or more with the division 293 tax. You actually pay a little bit more tax. We actually did briefly mention on the back of that, that you can potentially, if you speak to your accountant, you can potentially get um, the dollars out of super that went in above that limit. Um, there are asset write-offs for small businesses slash uh, temporary full expensing. This is super important for anyone that does, or anyone that has a small business, whatever you're doing. Um, negatively geared properties. I think this is going to be front and center of the news for the next one to two years, mate. I feel like we're going to have more people uh, talking about this. Capital gains, tax and losses. Remember that 12-month window? Uh, Jake used the example of holding shares for more than 12 months. Um, Really important, particularly for investors, whether you're in ETFs or you're in shares or whatever. Um, Keep that in mind. Medicare levy surcharge and how that interacts with private health slash hospital cover um, and how you can maybe get rid of the surcharge component if you hold it for the full year but you still pay the levy. Um, that's that base rate. And finally, income protection insurance. You may be able to claim or you can claim um, the cost of that insurance. Um, if it's held inside your super though, you you won't be able to do that against your individual income. Mate, there are so many great things there. I feel like if $2,000 is the average, if you do your tax right um, and you earn a decent wicket, you're going to, you know, there are, there are many other things on top of this that we could have gone into, but I feel like there's a lot here for a lot of people um, that should help them um, if not get a refund, at least neutralize some of that tax bill come tax time. Um, quick one for you. Um, like, give us a plug. Tell us a bit more about AirTax. Like, where can people go to find out more? Yeah, absolutely. So, AirTax has been around for oh, about six years. Um, and it's so you can jump on. Easiest way to look at it is airtax.com.au. Um, it's a really quick, tech enabled way to lodge your return. Um, so, we do business activity statements. Um, we do tax returns as well. It's it's really cheap in terms of being competitive out there in the market. Like you can you can lodge a tax return for ninety nine bucks. Um, you can talk to someone um, for a little bit more than that in terms of walking through your actual taxes to complete it. Um, where you got questions or where you just want to you want to run stuff by an individual, which I think nowadays is is super important. People want to know that there's someone behind there that's supporting it. Um, so we definitely do that. Um, we kind of specialize in individuals as well as sole traders, particularly like the gig economy is our, as our massive kind of market at the moment. So if you're someone in that space, definitely have a, have a chat to us because, um, it, it can be confusing logic, particularly if it's your first tax return, lodging that yourself, um, outside of actually like the paid services though, I definitely want to plug out our help center, um, because there's a heap of articles we'll be, um, updating those like literally hundreds, um, updating them again for this year. So all the stuff that we kind of chatted to, um, you can find online in that help center as well. There's stuff for, say, like a tradies specific section that we spoke to. Um, there mm, is st- that. stuff for, say, care workers, um, another big market that we look after. Um, yeah, heaps of whether it be, say, ride share as well. Um, jump on, have a look. Um, and yeah, if you want to chat to us, please do. Otherwise, if you feel like it's a match, um, as I said, it's pretty price competitive. So, and you get a tax deduction anyway, which which reduces it further. So, um, it could be a good fit for you. Cool, mate. I like it. Um, there'll be links in the show notes. And um, yeah, Jake, if you have anything that you want to share or leave with the audience, we'll we'll, we'll pop that in the show notes as well. So, um, I always like doing these chats, mate, because you make, like I said, you make it fun. You make it, um, you know. I guess profitable for us as well. So it's it's great to have you on the show, mate. And um, yeah, thanks for joining me yet again for the second episode for this tax series. Uh, my absolute pleasure. Thanks very much, Owen. As I said, I'm yeah super humbled to be back. It wraps, and it's always fun to chat to you as well. So thank you, mate. Appreciate it. Just a quick note from me before we wrap up today's show. 
Jacob discussed making personal super contributions and then claiming a tax deduction for that contribution. To clarify, if you make a super contribution from your after-tax income, aka you transfer money directly from your bank account to your super fund, you may be able to claim a tax deduction for that. However, before you claim a deduction for your contribution, you must give your super fund a notice of intent to claim form. You can find this form by heading to the ATO website, asking your super fund or speaking to your accountant. According to the ATO website, you may be able to make a claim for this tax deduction after the end of the tax year in which you made the contribution. For example, up until you lodge your tax return or until the end of the next tax year. In any case, make sure you understand the rules before claiming a deduction. For example, make sure your super fund has sent you a written acknowledgement telling you they have received a valid notice before you claim the money in your tax return. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast, where our mission is to improve the financial futures of all Australians. If you'd like to learn more, create a free account at rusk.com.au forward slash account to download free episode workbooks, bonus resources, and take our amazing free personal finance courses. You can also join our online community by following the link in the description. If you enjoyed the show, what we'd love is for you to leave us a snappy review on iTunes. And you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Rask Australia. Kate and I are also on both of those channels. Finally, if you have any feedback, suggestions for episodes or guests to come on the show, or you just have a question for us, shoot us an email at podcast at rask.com.au. This podcast was proudly sponsored by InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginner Investors. Build your investing confidence for only $49.50. Learn what it takes to be a successful investor with InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginners. This online course is self-paced over three months with live weekly webinars designed to help you achieve your financial goals and create wealth. To start your investing journey today, head to investsmart.com.au bootcamp or simply click the link in your podcast player.